Loading. Welcome to Access the Animus. Hello everyone and welcome to a new video here on Access the Animus. As promised, today we're going to have a look at the story news concerning the Dawn of Ragnarok DLC for Assassin's Creed Valhalla, but I'm a person that talks a lot, and so what was planned to be a single video has turned into a two-parter one. So in this first part we're going to look at the narrative context for this upcoming mythological expansion, of course reading through the lines of the mythological veil and trying to grasp the actual and underlying Eastern narrative, and we're going to start by analyzing all the information that we have about the prequel comic Forgotten Myths coming from four different synopses. We are then going to discuss the few official information about the story of the DLC taking place in the Viking Age and starring Eivor, before diving into the mythological side of things of the expansion and discussing the invasion during the Isu era of the territory here called Svartalfheim at the hands of the Isu known as Surtur and the army that he gathered, the motivations behind this invasion and also some references to the pieces of Eden that can be found in the main game, and of course you can expect some speculations and theories of our own based on all this information. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking it, subscribing to our channel and turning the notifications on so you won't miss any of our future videos and updates. And with that out of the way, let's dive into the story news about Dawn of Ragnarok. So, we already talked about the basics of the storyline of Dawn of Ragnarok in our previous video, where we mentioned Odin's voyage to Svartalfheim, which is going to be set after the events of the Asgard and Jotunheim arcs from the main game, and where we discussed the purposes of this voyage, that is, for Odin to save his kidnapped son Baldur while also defending the local dwarves from the invasion of the Muspel and Jotun forces commanded by Surtur. In these two videos though, we're going to delve much deeper into all the story details about Dawn of Ragnarok that we know of or that we can surmise or hypothesize based on all the sources at our disposal. More importantly though, throughout the entire video but also while playing the DLC, you should always remember that this is not or at least should not be a story about mythological gods, but a mythological layer placed upon an Isu story involving Isu characters from different Isu groups belonging to different Isu territories and so on. Try and keep that interpretation while looking at the events as this, again, should be the key to look at the story as it is going to be presented. So let's have a look at some of the story information that we have and as usual we're going to try and do that in a chronological order, at least when we can. And we start with some information that doesn't concern the DLC at all, but instead it's prequel comic called Assassin's Creed Valhalla Forgotten Myths. I know, comics might not be for everyone and the setting as well, but there's going to be Loki and Baldur inside, so give it a try at least. Forgotten Myths is going to be a series of three comics written by Alex Freed and drawn by artist Martin Tunica, who already worked on the Song of Glory comics that I honestly wasn't a huge fan of, and like I said, this series will act as a prequel and set up for the events of Dawn of Ragnarok. As of now we have four synopses for the comic, two of which are pretty much new as far as I know. The first one, which can be found in many sources, is pretty generic and mentions that the story of the comic will follow Baldur, Odin's son, in a quest to forge a lasting peace among the various realms, which again, as we explained in our series of videos dedicated to the analysis of Valhalla's story, should correspond to the various territories and groups or races of the Isu civilization. The second synopsis, which is the most common one, mentions that Thor, Baldr and Heimdall have discovered trouble lurking at Asgard's border, with a fire giant from Muspelheim threatening the land of the Aesir. So we do know that before the events of the DLC, Surtur, the Isu leader represented in the mythological layer as a fire giant, did attack Asgard, but the attack was unsuccessful and after the battle, Baldr discovered that an army of Muspels, the warriors led by Surtur, was massing at the gates of another realm slash Isu territory, that of Svartalfheim, which we are going to see in the DLC, and thus, in order to avoid another battle like the one that happened at the borders of the Asgardian Isu territory, Baldr set himself on a journey to Svartalfheim in order to bring peace between the realms. 
So from this description we kind of know why Baldur from Asgard ended up in Svartalfheim, and from the next synopsis which is one of the two lesser known ones and comes from Amazon, we'll get an idea about how and why he was kidnapped by Surtur. In fact, this new description mentions that in order to prevent the bloodshed of a potential war between Muspelheim and Svartalfheim, Baldur will enlist the help of none other than Loki, which is kind of weird considering how much Odin and Loki already hated each other at the end of the Jotunheim arc, unless Baldur is oblivious to all of that. So the description asks, will Loki betray Baldur and the rest of the Aesir? which he already did during the Asgard arc, so yeah. Or will Baldur win the heart of the daughter of Surtur and forge a lasting peace between the Nine Realms? And the final synopsis, which is actually for issue 2 of the comic, even doubles down on that, adding that Baldur and Loki will seek out rare items to give to the Muswell Princess, who is actually called Asa or Isa. Mm, I don't know about that, Baldur. The last time your father tried to win the... Let's call it heart of the daughter of another Isu country leader, it didn't end up well, but you do you, I guess. So this is what we know about the prequel story to Dawn of Ragnarok. It's not going to go as planned for Baldur because he's going to be directly kept or kidnapped by Surtur and will need his father to save him in the DLC. And if the cover of the comic is anything to go by, this man is indeed Baldur and the crown he's holding may or might not be a piece of Eden that he might be offering to Surtur's daughter or to Surtur himself. But we can also see some more details tied to him. Under his left bracer we can see what looks to be flowers, maybe for Surtur's daughter, but also look like mistletoe, the actual object that did eventually cause Baldur's death. On his right side we can see he's holding a hammer, which might be Mjolnir itself, as Thor might have given it to him during the battle at Asgard's borders, and a brooch featuring the Manas rune, which we already established to be the symbol of Muspelheim. Who knows, maybe this is Baldur trying his best to gain the appreciation of Surtur's daughter. Issue 1 of Forgotten Myths will be released on March the 16th, and yes, I don't think it makes that much sense to release the first issue of a prequel comic one week after the release of the main content it ties in, but what do I know? Anyway, that's everything we know for now about the events predating Dawn of Ragnarok, so let's now dive into the DLC itself, but before jumping into the mythological part, we already have a little amount of information about the setup for the DLC that takes place during the Viking Age within Eivor's story. From the Scar's information released through the interviews, we know that Eivor will have to face some visions of a new threat, including some vivid nightmares about Baldur, and thus, as usual, will turn to Valka, who will likely prepare a new concoction that in turn will allow Eivor to fall into a deep slumber, as it was the case for the Asgard and Jotunheim arcs, and then access Odin's memories once again. That's pretty much it in terms of official news concerning the Viking Age story, if we don't count Ubisoft's actual additional confirmation within the CGI trailer of female Eivor or just Eivor being the actual historical character that lived in the Viking Age and who is experiencing Odin's memories in Svartalfheim, and honestly, some additional confirmations never hurt. Now that we know about the prequel events, we can surmise that the DLC is happening sometime after the events shown in the Forgotten Myths comic, as in the DLC the invasion of the Isu territory represented as Svartalfheim at the hands of Surtur and his forces has already started and Baldur has already been kidnapped and kept in chains inside of a jail, seemingly at the top of a tower. Surtur is commanding an army of Jotnar and Muspels, that is warriors from Jotunheim and Muspelheim, and you might recall that through the mythological veil we identified the Jotnar as the Greco-Roman Isu, that is the Isu group featuring Jupiter, Juno, Minerva, Alithia, etc., and whose temples and thus territory range from the modern United States western coast to central Europe and beyond, and here we are seeing that they allied with Surtur and the people 
people from Muspelheim. There is another Isu group and or race that has been identified by narrative director Darby McDavid as being in control of all of North Africa and hopefully will be identified in game as well. Because this magic and mythological veil can only work if you provide some real Isu anchor points otherwise longtime fans will probably not care. And it doesn't surprise me that these two groups of Isu are allies, as they both fought the Asgardian Isu on the borders of Asgard, and well, the Greco-Roman Isu saw Odin steal the Seven Method from them and collaborate with Juno, so of course any enemy of the Asgardians would have looked as a friend to them. I low-key would have liked to play as them and punch Odin's face instead, but I guess I won't be able to. Also, get it? Low-key play as them? Well anyway, these two Isu groups are invading Svartalfheim and their leader Surtur is apparently a giant, as he was described in the Norse mythology, meaning that he was a supposedly big and tall Isu and an unkillable one at that, based on the info provided during the various interviews. Under the occupation by Surtur's forces, Svartalfheim has become a hostile, lava-filled area patrolled by Odin's enemies, and in order to survive, quoting the Ubisoft website, he will need to find hidden shelters across the territory and seek help from the dwarves who've taken refuge in them. Of course, following the interpretation that we mentioned earlier, the dwarves and Svartalfheim should be supposed to represent another group or race of the Isu in the territory that they're living in. Within the information provided by the sources, they are described as the greatest artisans in the land, so we can consider them as a group of... Isu engineers, if you will? And they have been driven into exile by Surtur's armies, so it will be apparently up to Odin to find them. Actually, we have already known of one Isu member of this group or case that is Ivaldi, the dwarf that created Gleipnir, the unbreakable cord that Odin used to imprison Fenrir in the Asgard Ark. In that arc, Ivaldi pretty much confirmed he was a dwarf or Isu from Svartalfheim, and he intended to go back after he was released from his duty by Odin in order to quote unquote dig the Earth's riches, which makes him so very likely to reappear in Dawn of Ragnarok. The Asgard arc also mentioned the existence of Ivaldi's sons in the AC lore, and they are known within the Norse mythology for creating Gangnir, Odin's spear that can be found in the game. In the AC lore we can find two documents sent to Ivaldi by his son Alf, presumably located in Svartalfheim, who writes to his father to mention some journals filled with insight that he had left him with, and also to state that while Ivaldi was still in Asgard, the unspecified great work was still going on back in Svartalfheim, as the dwarf slash engineer Isu kept mining and living within the mountains, which they believed would have also allowed them to survive the Toba catastrophe or Ragnarok when the time came. So Svartalfheim is a place where the Isu supposedly dug and worked on the materials they found, and interestingly enough, according to the recent news, this is where all the quote-unquote famous magical weapons and artifacts have come from, and where by the time Odin reaches the region, most of the dwarves have been imprisoned and forced to search for ancient artifacts or to craft weapons for the upcoming war against the gods. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, as this is basically showing how Svartalfheim seems to be the location where the pieces of Eden, or at least some pieces of Eden, are created, and where the Isu dug the material used to create them, which I'll bet all my AC2 florins on it being the gold that can be seen on the Svartalfheim peaks, and that the dwarves notoriously mine in almost every kind of folklore. We also got some kind of confirmation about Svartalfheim being a location where the pieces of Eden are created, again through the PlayStation blog, where it was stated that within the expansion players will be able to find details on how Thor's armor or Excalibur were forged. So this plot point could make the story pretty interesting for the fans of the Isu lore, even despite the mythological and magical layer, but interestingly enough, this wasn't at all the first time we heard about or even saw the material that is used to create the pieces of Eden or a forge to create them. 
Within the modern day such material is called Pathorica, and we actually did see it in the Fate of Atlantis DLC for Assassin's Creed Odyssey named as Adamant and mined from a quarry called Adamant Metallon, located next to Atlantis. In that DLC, for which, let's not forget, nobody knows what of its visuals, story and characters is actually confirmed as canon, in that DLC we could actually see some Isu devices created out of this metal and the Isu Aita mentioning that said material could restructure portions of the human brain responsible for emotions and thus suppress fear in what would have later become the creatures of the Olympus project. So following that line of thought, if any of those events and lines of dialogue from Fate of Atlantis actually happened at some point, we could even hypothesize that if this was one of the quarries that we are going to see in Svartalfheim, then maybe Svartalfheim itself could be another mythological depiction of the same territory that we know as Atlantis and that was controlled by the Isu Poseidon. Still, there's too many unconfirmed, confusing and vague elements in Fate of Atlantis and not enough information about Dawn of Ragnarok to know for sure, so you know, let's just see if any of that actually turns out to be true. Going back to what we said earlier though, the information provided by the Ubisoft websites themselves also stated that in Svartalfheim the dwarves have been forced to craft or search for artifacts and weapons by Surtur's forces quote unquote, in order to prepare for an upcoming war against the gods, so it looks like Surtur's invasion of this Isu territory wasn't for the sake of itself, but it was planned in order to prepare a bigger war against the Asgardian Isu, and I would assume that this huge war against the Asgardians might be the one that took place as Ragnarok, that is the Toba catastrophe, came to pass. The reason for that idea is, well, first because that's also part of the Norse mythology where Surtur was destined to lead the fire giants into battle against the gods at the time of Ragnarok, charging across the Bifrost which would break under their weight and then joining forces with the frost giants along with Fenrir, Jormungandr and Loki against the Aesir. The second reason though is that a very limited version of that is already part of the Assassin's Creed lore as the final calculation that Odin receives at the end of the Asgard arc of Valhalla's main game states that during Ragnarok, Jodnar will stalk your street as fire rains upon your heads, which already implied the battle between the Asgardian and the Greco-Roman Isu during the Toba catastrophe and now it does look like Surtur's invasion of quote unquote and quote unquote Svartalfheim was to prepare and also join the Greco-Roman Isu in their final war against the Asgardians. And that was it for the first of our two videos dedicated to the story news about the Dawn of Ragnarok expansion and our speculations about it. What are your opinions and expectations about the narrative of this DLC? Do you expect any cool revelations about the Isu lore or do you think it will cater more towards the mythological side of things with less focus on the Isu aspects? And do you agree or disagree with our theories and speculations? Let us know about all of that in the comments below. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in our next video.